This is Redesign and I am Annegret Böhnemann. Thanks for tuning in. This is our first episode and so I am going to take the time to tell you more about us, what we do and what you can expect to hear. This is our first podcast and my first time hosting. So we do what everyone does when they get started. We learn as we go. I am working as a responsible designer at For You and Your Customers, which is a special company as it places learning at the heart of its philosophy and company culture. Besides planning, designing and developing digital solutions, we are all about self-reflection and developing ourselves and the people around us. That is also why we launched the Redesign community in June this year which connects researchers, designers, developers, strategists, marketers, managers, and many more people working in the digital industry. We all share the one goal of creating a better future, one that is more resilient, more sustainable, and more inclusive. We are exploring new formats like online events, as well as this podcast, which gives you the greatest flexibility to listen from a place and at a time of your own choosing. Knowledge transfer and connection are our primary mission. We welcome you in our community of passionate experts. We appreciate you listening. Redesign stands for responsible design. And while there are many definitions for responsible design, to us it means looking at and designing with a special pair of lens on. One that places extra attention to topics like sustainability, inclusivity, privacy and collaboration. This podcast is made to look at these topics together with guests and members of the collective. Enjoy listening! Since our first online event in June, several members of the community have asked us why companies should invest in responsible design. Or in other words, what's the business case of responsible design? And since that question appeared so pressing, and since this is our first podcast, we decided to keep it simple, but also to make it a special edition in which we give our own answers to this question. I am here today with Cecilia Scodaro, who is my colleague and the head of responsible design at For Junior Customers. Cecilia sees that companies and organizations play an important role in shaping a better future by providing products and services that bring change. Cecilia will discuss with us why it is relevant for businesses to shift their perspective away from growth and short-term thinking. Welcome, Cecilia. And Thank you. Thanks for discussing with me this important topic. Could you introduce yourself a bit? Of course. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, well, I'm Cecilia Scolaro. I've been uh, working in digital and customer experience for the last uh, 15 years. And uh, I've been uh, dealing with all sorts of different areas of digital, from branding uh, to marketing to uh, design. And specifically in the last uh, year and so, uh, I started to shift more and more focus around uh, inclusivity and responsibility and sustainability as uh, the main focus of my work. So how would you describe, what is it that brought you to responsible design? Well, it is a bit of a mix actually of uh, inner motivation and external triggers. Mm -hmm. So on one side, I've uh, always been interested in uh, these topics. So, but there was always been a disconnect a bit with uh, my per personal and professional <laughs> life. Uh, but what I uh, experienced in the last couple of years is a overall shift. Uh, in the world around mm -hmm. uh, uh, inclusivity, around uh, equality, around sustainability. It's like a collective uh, consciousness uh, level and uh, that is reflected in so many aspects of our personal and, uh, and our economy, in uh, uh, the way that we take decisions. Uh, so. I uh, came to the conclusion that uh, as designers, uh, we could play a very important role mm -hmm. in this shift. And uh, that's why I decided to focus my energy here. So you already mentioned some of the topics that we find relevant in the theme of responsible design. And I've already given a bit of an introduction of that term, but maybe could you also tell us a bit more about that and how you define responsible design? 
Yeah, so I see very much responsible design as the evolution of uh, design that came all the way from service and experience and now is kind of taking a different perspective into scope. So mm -hmm. it's taking the planet and society and the community and even the respect for the individual into consideration. So. It's uh, an umbrella term that takes uh, under itself a lot of different uh, disciplines that were already there for a very long time. Uh, but we very much believe that as much as these uh, issues are connected in real life, they should be addressed in a connected way as well. So with issues you mentioned earlier, you mean topics like sustainability. Um, can you be more specific in how that topic matters when we speak about the digital industry? Because that is where people from the audience are coming from. Yeah, indeed. So digital is often deemed as uh, sustainable by definition. Uh, but often we don't consider uh, the physical implications of digital. So digital is very much physical, both from, uh, let's say, a machinery perspective. So the, the, um, the computers, the data that require digital to work and the data center but also very much in the impact mm -hmm. that it brings. It's not that when we order something on uh, e-commerce, it magically appears <laughs> on our <laughs> doorstep. <laughs> there is a whole physical implication that we need to take into consideration as digital professionals as well. Mm, that also makes me think of the human side of it, right? Like you say, it doesn't magically appear on our doorstep, but there are people involved. And that also makes me think of the other topic you mentioned, the inclusivity. Can you also be a bit more specific about how that topic matters when speaking about responsibility in the digital space? Well, uh, I think the whole uh, culture of startups and MVP brought us into this uh, culture of uh, uh, pushing products out mm -hmm. as fast as possible and always uh, consider the 80%, 20% rule, so uh, addressing 20% of your users that will actually create 80% of your business. Mm -hmm. What we did by that we actually marginalized people. We created conditions for which a certain uh, group of people cannot access our services, certain uh, groups of people feel, um, uh, feel that they are not represented by the products that we put out there. So inclusive design is very much about considering people in their wholeness, in the intersection of their uh, identities, and really be respectful of all of these different identities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally see that. But then I also see that this is like really big topics, right? This is a really big and complex issues. And if I were a client and if I put myself in the shoes of a client, then I would wonder how do my products, how do my services um, have to do with this? <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> but. You know, we always uh, uh, use uh, the concept of uh, fractals when we talk about this. Uh, we believe that there is uh, an element of big decision making, of course, on a strategic level where a company is going, but there are also so many tiny, very small decisions that we take in business every day. And specifically as a designer, specifically for those who deal with the front of a product or a service. While we take these decisions, we have a level of influence that sometimes we are not even aware of. And we can really uh, shift the overall perspective of a company towards uh, a more responsible direction. Can you maybe think of a company or a product that is out there that has already taken such fractal decisions? Yeah, well, there are many examples and some of them are uh, relatively uh, simple, or maybe invisible to many, like uh, making your digital tools completely accessible. And there are some that are uh, more strategic, more transformational, like 
Uh, Pandora decided not to use diamonds anymore or Zalando decided to open a second hand uh, uh, section of their website. That shows that there is a real uh, change uh, even in uh, mainstream channels, let's say. And how do you see that in relation to what the customers are expecting from such companies? Yeah, indeed, when I was talking about external triggers before, I also refer very much to the change, changes in consumer uh, behaviors. And uh, it's not just me saying it, but there is plenty of research and evidence in this direction. Among uh, uh, others, uh, let me refer to the EY uh, Future Consumer Index, uh, where 69% of uh, people interviewed declared that they believe that brands should change the world for good. Mm. It's a big statement. And uh, the uh, Edelman report also that talks about uh, trust, by the way, very interesting, uh, indicates that people expect companies to have a role, that uh, they also, uh, 86%, they expect brands to do more than just their business and to do something for uh, the world and society. So the, the decision-making process is changing from a consumer perspective. And uh, I think that it cannot be uh, denied uh, in the future of uh, any business. Yeah, and that is good that you mentioned it because I see that as something that is also happening in how young people are investing their very own money, yeah. that they are looking more into sustainable bankings. They open their accounts with more responsible banks like in the Netherlands, Triodos, or in Germany now tomorrow, which maybe cost a little bit more per month, but then they promise that they invest in more sustainable uh, impacts, right, in projects that have that Impact. Indeed, indeed, there is a very interesting research by CGS in 2019 in the US called the Consumer Sustainability Survey. It says the Generation Z uh, is more willing to pay more, even uh, up to twice as much for uh, something if it's sustainable. So. We uh, were calling it uh, critical consumption a few years ago, but now it's very much uh, deeper than that. And uh, the new generation is demanding a different role of companies in society. Yeah, that is, that is really interesting to see, right? That uh, we have on one hand the cons consumer behaviors and the demands of the consumers, but then also the investments of the consumers and other investors as well. Indeed. But then there's also the perspective of the law and the governmental role in there. How do you view that? Yeah, absolutely. There is uh, uh, so much talks all around the world around laws and regulations in this space. And uh, uh, the European Green Deal is uh, pushing in that direction. The um, European Accessibility Act is uh, coming into place as well. So those are all uh, conversations that are uh, making new requirements for companies as much as GDPR was introduced uh, a few years ago around privacy, uh, slowly <laughs> and maybe <laughs> a little bit late, but regulations are coming uh, in many different areas. In uh, California, dark patterns mm -hmm. were, uh, were uh, banned, basically, banned right? by regulations indeed. Though at the same time, when I think about these regulations, I always need to laugh a bit about it because I feel it's a very short list of regulations and policies out there. And if I think of the pressure that it's building up, it feels very little at the moment, right? Yeah, and that's why this is a system issue and require a system uh, answer. So it's not going to be any specific, like only regulation or only consumer behaviors mm -hmm. uh, or only company decision that are going to uh, face the complexity of this issue. It's only when you put all of these things together that are actually we are able to create some progress mm -hmm. in this space. And that is why we are focusing so much on self-reflection and understanding the role that each of us has as an individual into, uh, into this shift. So 
As individuals, we started already a few years ago questioning our use of plastic mm -hmm. or the way that we were uh, treating our trash. So the question now is very much how do we apply the same principle, the same way of thinking into our business decision mm -hmm. and specifically with responsible design in our design decisions. That is a very nice bridge, honestly, because what I hear more often lately is that individuals within their business context experience pushbacks. Yeah. That they see that the strategy of their company doesn't cover such topics, that the management doesn't make them a priority, that the structures and the processes in their company make it super difficult to design or implement these designs more responsibly. What kind of advice would you give to somebody who wants to realize these topics like accessibility, sustainability or inclusion in their work if the conditions are not that favorable? Yeah, well, first of all, I would uh, really advise to look at the small decisions as well, the ones that don't require very complex uh, programs. And at the same time, to build awareness and uh, make sure that more layers in the organizations are aware of uh, uh, more uh, goals than just uh, profit. I uh, very much like a metaphor I read recently by uh, Rebecca Henderson, and she talks about uh, humans uh, that need to breathe and eat and sleep uh, in order to live. But uh, the fact that those things are very important doesn't mean that we are making all our lives around breathing, eating or sleeping. The same is applicable to a company. I mean, profit or you know, being sustainable, financially sustainable is very important, but it doesn't mean that it should be our sole goal as uh, uh, business people. We have an opportunity to look beyond that. And in that sense, I mean, there has been plenty of evidence that sustainability uh, and uh, diversity are good uh, business decisions. I think that uh, it's really time to flip the conversation and start questioning ourselves uh, around the sustainability case uh, of business rather than the <laughs> business case of sustainability. So in other words, Can we afford not to do it? Can business live if there isn't a healthy planet and society to operate in? That actually makes me think of Patagonia, for instance, um, which is a super healthy, sustainable business. They have annual sales of something uh, above a billion euro, I think. And that company really showed how sustainability practices can help to generate strong financial returns, right? It doesn't need to go against each other. It can even go hand in hand. No, absolutely. But even uh, Nike uh, got uh, financial gains from uh, taking a stance uh, uh, on racial issues. Mm -hmm. And H&M uh, uh, is taking a financial stance on uh, financial gain from taking a stance on sustainability. So there is uh, plenty of examples out there that it is a good business decision, but I think we always need to be careful in approaching it without a utilitaristic uh, perspective, because the only way that we can really shift the perspective is if we change the narrative, if we change the tools we're using, and we really prioritize things in a different mm -hmm. way. That made me think of a topic you mentioned earlier, accessibility, because I feel that is always a very tangible example. People out there experience problems in using the internet or specific applications. And what the statistics of the European Commission and the United Nations show is that around 20% of the population worldwide experience problems with the accessibility of such websites. And we also know that the majority of these people are actually leaving a website when they experience these problems. And for instance, just in the Dutch market, this is about a loss of income per year of around a billion euro. So, I mean, it also shows that companies are missing out on that business if they are not looking into making such products um, accessible. And that brings me to the question, what do you think is a good moment in a process to bring into this topic of accessibility 
um, when designing a product or a service? Well, all of these uh, questions uh, are uh, good to be asked at the very beginning of a process. And I know that everybody always wants to be at the very beginning of any process. Uh, but in terms of the impact on the decision making, uh, uh, that this consideration may have is just makes sense because uh, re retrofitting something and make it accessible afterwards is way more complex than just designing something uh, already accessible. And also, I would like to point out that accessibility is very much a human right. You know, uh, I was recently at a very interesting talk uh, at the RightsCon and the Human Rights uh, Convention around technology. And uh, Susanna Pallero, she's an activist uh, on accessibility. She basically was uh, questioning whether we actually need to talk about the business case around accessibility because it is very much about the human rights of people to be able to access certain products and services, specifically uh, when provided that by the public. And in that perspective, the European Union already has done a good step in 2016 with the Web Accessibility Directive. But I think that in the private sector, we also need to move forward. Well, I understand very much your human rights point of view, but then I also wonder, and many other people might wonder, how does that fit into the economy? Yeah, well, uh, the concept of the economy is evolving uh, as well. I mean, there are uh, Nobel Prizes uh, and uh, authors uh, like Mariana Mazzucato, Esther Duflo. Uh, I really uh, invite you to discover their work, that they're really talking about uh, how we need to reimagine uh, the way that our economy is organized. And there are also some very practical models like the donuts economies or uh, the uh, butterfly model of circular economy. So, I mean, the, the, the original concept of the idea that many people have around the economy is also uh, evolving. And uh, we can see that also in the financial market, how there is a new pressure around the ECG, the environment, social and governance uh, factors uh, rating of a company. So there, the, whole, uh, the whole economy is shifting and we need to shift our design and our digital tools as well. Yeah, and also, of course, we see in companies that there are new roles created around this, right? We see that there are now corporate social responsibility officers or inclusion uh, experts coming in. So we, we see that it, it's reflected, especially in the large companies. Yes, indeed. Uh, and the question I think sometimes is still, how does it apply to my own expertise? How do I apply to my digital tools? And that's very much where the kind of work we are doing. We are exploring in a fractal way how the small decision and the big decision can be taken with a responsible approach. And we are doing it also by connecting different expertises and different people because we sometimes encounter uh, people that are very much frustrated uh, about what they believe in and what they're actually able to implement in their own companies. And so the point of the community is very much connecting different experiences and different expertise and make people help each other in pushing these uh, items further in the corporate agendas. Um, that makes me think that we have people from very different professions listening in, like the designers, researchers, but also developers, product owners and managers and others. So that makes me wonder, out of these, what do you think, who can make a difference and how? Like in a company, where should an initiative around sustainability and responsibility start, in your opinion? Well, I'll refer back to the fractal element. I think everybody, every role can have uh, uh, influence on the overall uh, shift uh, towards responsibility. 
and uh, uh, it's there isn't the right way of doing it. There isn't one framework that is going to work uh, in any company. So it's uh, uh, very much about uh, understanding the context of uh, your business and your uh, responsibilities and try with the small things and start with the, uh, with the conversations internally foster this uh, dialogue and uh, really uh, analyze and uh, uh, reflect on the role that we have played up until this point. Because we have uh, taken decisions, uh, we have applied uh, frameworks, we have applied ideas that are complicit in some of the exploitation that uh, the business has uh, been responsible for. So it's uh, very important that we don't just always point towards others, Mm -hmm. but we look at uh, the role that each of us can take in this. I think that's a very nice way of rounding up this conversation. But I also would like to leave you the space. Is there anything that you feel should still be said? Is there anything that you would still like to add? Well, I think that it's very important that we keep a long-term perspective. And that's going to shift a lot of the focus from the clicks and the views and the user satisfaction and more towards their well-being, their safety, their sense of representation, the impact on the planet. So. It's uh, uh, it's very much applying a lot of the things that we've done up, up until now, but with different uh, scope, but with a different lenses. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, designers can play a very important role in this. Thanks a lot, Cecilia, for taking the time today. Thank you. And for the audience, I really hope that this conversation provided you some answers on why businesses should invest in responsible design. While we only provided you with one perspective, we hope that engaging in this sort of thinking has opened your eyes. The business case for sustainability has been proved time and again. By now we know that some things will pay back more quickly than others, but overall it's really about the business value. Investing in responsibility results in lower costs and risks, but also results in more innovation and enhanced brand value. So the health of our business really relies on the health of our planet and a solid social foundation. Protecting and supporting those must always be our first consideration when doing business. If you would like to explore this topic further, please feel free to look at the list of resources that we have used to inform the content of this talk. Check out the link in the description of this podcast to find more examples, case studies, articles and books. Thanks again for tuning in. This was the first episode of the Redesign podcast. If you enjoyed, feel free to subscribe.